and then later on in the evening I did go to a social environment uh, where they were playing the Oilers game and I questioned that at the bar but they have a contract there so I kind of chuckled but I was working late last night honest and uh, actually I regret missing Abby Lewis I was at an AGM and uh, unfortunately I missed that one but I want to introduce our guest speaker Asbjorn Ball is advisor at the Norwegian Union of Municipal and General Employees and director of the broad campaign for the welfare state trained in history and sociology he has many years of experience in the trade union movement at the national as well as the international level. He is currently section vice president of the International Transport Workers Federation and also a member of the coordinating committee of Forum Social Europe, an informal trade union network. Uh, Asbjorn is also the chair of the Urban Transport Committee for the ITWF and also chair for the working group, uh, work group climate change for the ITWF. He has published a number of articles on political, social, and labor questions in magazines and books, both in Norway and international, uh, internationally. So I would like to introduce Asbjorn Vall. time, so the previous one have got enough. Probably. No. Uh, I always feel welcome when I come here. But I do know also that not, not all Norwegians are welcome in Alberta. And last year we, I think, in a uh, joint struggle in Alberta and in Norway, we were able to get Statoil back home, the Norwegian oil company that just that last year withdrew from the tar sand uh, catastrophe up uh, north. <coughs> they didn't. Yeah, it's it's worth to me. They didn't uh, say then back home that they came home because of resistance. They say it was plain financial reasons why they stopped the Tarzan project, but we think that it was also influenced by the very bad reputation that we contributed to create in Norway and your struggle here in Alberta that they went home from this project. I, am a <clears throat> I come from a country uh, which currently has one of the most <coughs> right-wing governments in Western Europe. And you have invited me here to inform you and inspire you with all the successes and achievements we have made in Norway over the last few years. So, understand me when I say that when I, it's not an easy task you have given me. <laughs> Anyway, we can learn from most experiences and we did have some ex very uh, important experiences in Norway uh, some years ago in order to influence policy and I'm going to uh, share that with you today. Uh, but first, I think 
uh, I would try to sort of paint the big picture of the situation we are in because we are in uh, living through very difficult times uh, under, current, under contemporary capitalism. It is and it has been for quite a while in a deep systemic crisis. And this crisis has been met by politicians across the board by deregulating markets, abolishing capital control, turning more and more into neoliberal policy, whether they call themselves left or right. And we have seen that capitalism has restructured and reorganized based on this new neoliberal strategy of globalization, as they call it, and I want us to believe that this globalization is a law of nature, it isn't. It is the result of deregulation and privatization and more power to capital. That is globalization. And they are trying also to institutionalize neoliberalism, neoliberalism at the global level. First and foremost through a number of trade agreements which uh, put the national uh, parliaments and local parliaments out of power in a way and also by other sorts of agreements. We have seen an enormous shift in the balance of power in society. There is no more room for broad class compromises in the current situation. And remember the post-war situation, the post-war development, particularly I think in Europe, in Western Europe, but also in Canada, uh, was influenced by this class compromise in which labor and capital went into a sort of agreement, uh, declared peace towards it, uh, each other. And there was a reason for that. The reason was that labor and social forces was so strong that capital felt that it had to go to the table and negotiate with them. It is a question of power. That's what it all is about. And that's what have changed over the last uh, 30 years. A little bit about the European, but also the interna international context, which also the Norwegian uh, experiments took place in. From about 1980, we have had 35 years of neoliberalism. More or less strong neoliberalism differs from country to country, but there has been neoliberalism. Deregulating, market orientation, more power to capital, less power to labor and to social forces. And the financial crisis of 2007-2008, no, after that, turned into a deep debt crisis. And in Europe we have seen that has gone further into social and political crisis, which is about to destroy some of the countries. We have seen draconian austerity policies carried out by an increasingly authoritarian European Union in Europe through the so-called Troika. The Troika in Europe, if you don't know what it is, it is the European Commission. It is the European Central Bank and they are supported by this very uh, progressive international organization, the International Monetary Fund, as you know very well because they have experience of how to destroy national states. And this is the Troika that has taken much of the power in Europe for the time being. And as I heard here yesterday, you also have the same problem, of course, with more and more authoritarian government, less democracy. It's a dangerous situation. We also see, as a result of this shift, enormous shift in the balance of power in society, an enormous redistribution of wealth on all the three levels which are important for the distribution of wealth in a country from labor to capital from public to private through privatization and competitive tendering and from the poor to the rich it is going on we have never ever in the history of humankind see, seen anything like that in such a short time 
whether 1% or 10% or 0.1% at the top are able to get most of the value added in our economies. In Europe, we see a massacre of the welfare states is going on in the most crisis-ridden countries, like Greece, like Italy, like Spain, like Portugal, and also a number of the new uh, countries in Eastern Europe. I have a couple of points to underline before I start with the Norwegian experiences, and that is in Norway, in Europe, we have a discussion going, and many people on the left, also in the labor movement, in the trade union movement, they criticize the austerity policies in Europe for failing to counteract the effects of the crisis. And there are good reasons for that, but there are also a sort of understanding that comes out of that criticism, which I think is not maybe not the best way of dealing with it. Because the aim of the austerity policies in Europe is not to regain economic growth and to create jobs. It is implemented in order to destroy the welfare state and to defeat trade unions. Simply. That is the reason why they are mobilizing. It is a deliberate policy, it is not a mistaken policy. These guys are extremely clever. How else could they have been so creative in secure themselves all the wealth that they have, they have taken over over the last 30 years. They have enriched themselves at a speed which is unprecedented in our new modern history. So they are clever. So don't think that they are, they are mistaken. Don't think they are pursuing a policy which is wrong because they don't understand better. They understand very well what is going on. And that's the problem. This represents the end of the post-World War II class compromise. Capitalist forces have withdrawn from the compromise, compromise which they entered into around the Second World War. And they are now attacking what they previously accepted in the name of the compromise. What is going on is a top-down class war. And that is what we have to, to, to face. And it's all about power, stupid. <laughs> to play on Clinton's saying. <coughs> the future of our societies will first and foremost depend on how the balance of power develops. Mainly between labor and capital, but also with other groups, of course, involved. In the current situation, capitalist forces are on the offensive. It's easy to see, it is easy to feel. Popular forces are on the defensive. We are on the defensive. But that is not a natural law. And after, if you remember back to 2008, when the financial crisis was at the deepest, a lot of the representatives from the elite came forward and said, oh, we have to regulate this, we cannot accept this. And all that. But there was no force on the streets. The labor movement was not on the streets, the trade unions were not on the streets, demanding regulation and control and democratic control of the economy. So it, took, it didn't take long before the elite forgot all about regulation and they've continued to deregulate, to use the crisis as an opportunity to shift further the balance of power in society. So we haven't seen any measures put in place in order to limit the power of capital, of financial capital in our societies. <coughs> and that proves to us, once again, as we have seen before in history, only massive mobilization of social forces can form the basis for a real social transformation. And that's the reason why you are here, I hope, and why I am here visiting you as well. And when we need this labor movement, this during the modern history has been the most important social force from below in society, it is in a deep political ideological crisis. And they are on the losing side.
for the time being. Trade union movements all over the world have lost members. There is hardly any exception of that over the last 20, 30 years. They also have some <coughs> deep political and ideological problems. System criticism, which was part of the education of the members when the trade union movement started 150 years ago, 30 years ago, is not there, it is more or less non-existent in the movement, and we need it. The social partnership ideology that grew out of the class compromise in the post-war period is still very strong. And I'm more and more surprised how strong it can be in a situation where our adversaries attack us day by day. Why should they think that this compromise is still alive? Why should this social partnership ideology, this social dialogue, as they call it, and so on and so, still be at the top of the instruments that trade unions think they could use in order to make progress? They can't. That part of history is over. And we see too few attempts at mobilizing for a power struggle, which we need today. We need a power struggle. We need to mobilize sufficient social forces in order to confront other our adversaries. But we have seen social democratic and socialist parties losing trust, understandably, since they have supported all the policies which have led to the current disastrous situation. The deregulation, a lot of the privatizations, and so on and so on, have been supported by social democratic parties all over the world. What we see today, after a long period of deep problems, however, is that there is increasing social unrest among people, among workers, among women, in the public sector, among indigenous people, and so on and so on. So, so there is a growing unrest going on. But so far, we have to say, it is without sufficient coordination, it is without a clear leadership. So that was sort of a setting the situation in context. So that we also can understand what has been going on in Norway, which I will turn to now to explain for you what we did in Norway, which in a short time was a success. We were able to turn the tide a little bit to change the direction of political development. This is the map of Norway. Oslo is the capital of Norway. I put on another city, the third biggest city in, in Norway, which is called Trondheim, because that is one of the important places which I'm going to tell you about, where they still have very positive effects of the new way of working that we started 10, 15 years ago. First, some few information on Norway. It's a small country, far away, you know, maybe not so much about Norway. Even if they promote themselves very well all over the world, and a lot of money to do that. Somebody, a lot of people see Norway and Sweden and Denmark, the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries, as heaven on earth with a successful welfare state. And I'm surprised that people continue to talk as if that is the situation, because it isn't. Well, we are still on top. It's very easy to be on the top when everybody under you disappears <laughs> further down. <laughs> so what I do used to say is, yes, we are. Norway, it's not Sweden anymore. It's Norway now which is at the top because of this enormous uh, amount of oil money. So we are at the upper deck. But it is the upper deck of Titanic. <laughs> we are not a member of the European Union. That's important because it gives us some independence from the European Union institutions. But not as much as you maybe think 
and not as much as the leadership in Norway think either. Because we, are, we have an agreement with the European Union called the European Economic Area, which includes Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein. Among the three, Norway is a superpower. <laughs> but that means also 70% of the legislation in the European Union also applies to Norway. We are part of the European common market and so on. So, so we are strongly integrated into it. We do for the time being have a government which we in Norway call the Blue Blue Government. And the Blue Blue, there are two parties in the government, the Conservative Party, which is not so conservative, but well, okay, they, they are conservative, but mostly neoliberal. And the, the, there is the right-wing populist party. Norway is one of the very, very few countries in Europe which so far has let the right-wing populist party into government. And they are there now. The lucky situation in all these disastrous development <coughs> is that they do not have much majority along in the parliament. So they are dependent of one of two centre parties, which sort of slow down some of the things that they want to do. Norway is, anyway, an exception in the world. And that is first and foremost because of the, uh, the abundance of oil money that we have. We are the only European country, but, uh, I think the very few countries in the world, with no state debt. The opposite, quite the opposite. We have a hell of a lot of money. We don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and we have for the time being uh, a fund, an oil fund. They have renamed it pension fund in order to make it more difficult to use the money. And that is currently about 7,000 billion Norwegian crowns. And if there is six and a half Norwegian crown in a Canadian dollar, we can say it is little more than 1,000 billion Canadian dollars in this fund. It's actually, it is the biggest state-owned fund, investment fund in the world, in a country with 5 million inhabitants. Some economists, critical economists, say <coughs> we will never see those money. They are invested, they are not allowed to be invested in Norway, so they have to invest them abroad. And the rule is that they are using 4% of the 4% interest of this fund can be used in the state's budget every year. We have an unemployment rate of less than 4% that has been like that for quite a while. We have the, this is the only country in Western Europe of the last 15 years which have uh, an increase in real wages every year. So Norway is an exception. The different governments in Norway say that the reason why the Norway is an exception is because of their government. Yeah. We try to tell them that it has something to do with oil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we still have a strong trade union movement. 53% of workers in Norway are unionized. That's among the highest in the world. And it has not gone down, it has been stable at that level for a very long time. So this is the situation. But even though the situation is so good economically, they are running a soft neoliberal policy for a long time. And with this new government that we got one and a half years ago, they have strengthened this neoliberal part of it. So they are attack attacking now the labor laws, they are attacking the welfare state, and so on. So in order to explain to you what happened in Norway, was I go back to the situation as it was in the year 2000-2001. We had a very short period with the social democratic <coughs> minority government at that time, because the, the right-wing government broke down because the internal contradictions. So the 
social democratic minority go, took over in 2000. And they were pretty neoliberal at that time. So they carried through some of the most extensive privatization projects so far in Norway at that time. They partly privatized the, the telephone system, Telenor. They partly privatized Statoil, which was 100% owned by the state before that. And they introduced a hospital reform, which did not privatize the, the hospitals, but created a market and competition between state-owned hospitals, which were given more power to govern themselves. And after one year, there was an election in 2001, and the Labour Party was punished heavily by its own voters. So they had the worst election results since 1924, with about 24% support. And that is one of the social democratic parties in the world that have the highest level of support, over 40% in long period in the post-war period. But the left, the Labour Party's soft neoliberal policy when they were in government in this period, that gave way to an aggressive right-wing government. So the Labour Party lost in 2001 and opened for a right-wing government, which was quite aggressive. And for us in the labor movement, in the trade union movement, it became necessary to rethink the situation, to change, try to change the course and to take action in order to, to, to meet this new situation. And what did we do? Well, four important things, and I, I must admit that when I analyze and inform you about this now, I do it in retrospect. I wouldn't have been able to see this happen when it happened, because it happened independently from each other, but gradually it grew together into one big process or campaign. Four different and independent developments came together and changed Norway a little. Uh, one thing that happened that I was strongly involved in was the setup of the welfare state campaign, a broad coalition against private privatization for universal welfare, come back to that. The other thing which happened was that my union, the Municipal Workers' Union in Norway, established a new model of how to further develop and modernize and improve the public services and the public sector. The Model Municipality Project, that is called called. A union-initiated reorganization of public services from below as an alternative to the privatization and competitive tendering from the top. The third thing which happened was exactly in this city I showed you, the Trondheim model, as we call it now, but the local trade union council set the political agenda, mobilized and won, as we shall see. And the fourth thing, before the parliamentary election 2005, uh, a unified, more or less unified trade union movement pushed the Labour Party to the left, pushed it into a coalition with other parties for the first time in Norwegian history, pushed it in a coalition with the Socialist Left Party, which is a party on the left of the Labour Party, of course, and another party called the Centre Party, which is a peasant party in Norway, which never ever had been in any coalition with, with the Labour, with the left either, but because of the peasants also feel the pressure from neoliberalism and capitalism they have turned more to the left. And this coalition campaigned, and that was one of the achievements which we won during this campaign from 2000 up to 2005, we were able to push the Labour Party to the left. So the Labour Party, which had carried through some of the most important privatization projects in Norway in 2001, they campaigned in 2005 on an anti privatization platform, which was quite an achievement. And we had a great victory, and this co new coalition won the election. Okay, that was what we, <coughs> what we did, the four things, the four elements of this campaign that we succeeded in developing and slowly merging with each other. And we set all the same ourselves new aims, 
And we, I have to explain, we maybe, we was not, never a unified organization or one particular organization. It was an informal network of activists, of trade unions and other organizations that came together and didn't like the development we saw around us. And we wanted to stop the policy of privatization, to change public opinion, <coughs> to change political power balance, to push the Labour Party to the left, to create the political majority alliance, and also to shift the balance of power in society. Quite an ambitious project, I would say, in the situation we faced at that time. And in which way should we do that? Well, we developed four main pillars in the way we, we worked. First of all, we had to take the so-called ideological struggle of our own analysis of society, particularly in how to understand the welfare state, because there is so many strange understanding of the welfare state. Some think that it has come to be, that it's a new phase in the development of, of capitalism, and that the capitalist has accepted and all these kind of things. But most of us in, in this new campaign, we realize that the welfare state, the welfare state is not a stable social model. It is a temporary result of a very specific historic development around World War II and afterwards. The second thing was we wanted to build, we had to build broad social alliances to be able to carry out this policy. The third thing was that we developed alternatives to privatization. And the fourth thing was that we realized because of the political parties, the development of the political parties, mainly the Social Democratic Party, the Labour Party, was so disastrous that trade unions had to develop as more independent political actors themselves to take political responsibility at a broader, uh, much broader than trade unions used to. So, this was one of the models that <coughs> I developed, and, I, and which we used a lot of this educational people in order to make them understand was this welfare state, what, how it come, came to be. Because what, what we did in order to achieve the welfare state in the Nordic countries, was to tame capitalism, to regulate capitalism. So this is the private capital in society, and I do it pretty fast. And what we did, we, we regulated trade, trade protectionism in order to build national industry. We introduced capital control, as most of the Western countries did in the post-war period. We had fixed exchange rate, which prevented financial speculation. Uh, we had regulation of investments and bank banks and financial institutions. We had ever better labor legislation. And an increasing part of the total economy was taken out of the market and made subject to democratic control. The huge public sector growing. So this was a political <coughs> economy of the welfare state, to say it so. And without this regulation, which was quite, if we see it in today's perspective, this is a huge step from where we are today. And this was a precondition for building the welfare state. Without that kind of regulation, we would never have been able to do it. Because the international competition and all this uh, destroy the possibility to do that. When there is only open borders and no regulation. Okay, that was the fundament for the welfare state. Then came the 1970s, crisis, breakdown of class compromise, neoliberalism, capital control disappears and all these kind of things. So, in order to explain to people in Norway, we said that this model, that was the fundament, was the fundament of the welfare state, has disappeared, more or less. Because what happened during the 1980s and 1990s was the following. I'm not going to go into detail, but it happened like this. So that's where we are today. That's where you are today. That's where we all are today. And with this platform, with this basis, 
there is no possibility to build neither a welfare state nor a progressive society. So it is quite a task we have. It is not enough just to say no to a privatization or yes to it and I have small victories here or there. We have to tame capitalism. We have to take democratic control of the economy. So that was the first thing. We tried to analyze and have take the ideological struggle. The second thing we did was to build alliances. First and foremost, inside the trade union movement, that was important, mainly between the public sector and private sector trade unions, because they were not at the same line in Norway at that time. A number of the big and strong private sector trade unions in Norway said, we are not against privatization, we work in the private sector, and we do that very well. But we were able to, <clears throat> in 10 years, to unify the trade union movement to a degree that the Metal Workers Union Congress unanimously opposed privatization of public services. So we had that alliance. <clears throat> but we built also alliances with other interest based organizations peasants, women, um, users of public services all kind of organizations that wanted to be, join in in order to fight for the welfare services. Then we created the campaign for the welfare state <clears throat> in 1999. Trade unions in initiated a majority alliance between the three center left parties. In Oslo in particular, before the election in 2005, we created an alliance called Oslo 2005. In all, we, and we said the following, we have had neoliberal policies now in 30 years, whether that's been a Labour government or the right wing or centre government. We are fed up of that. We demand a new political course. That was the simple message that we had in this Oslo 2005 alliance. And we marched in the street with it and we delivered, delivered leaflets and all these kind of things. And what we experienced also that this alliance building itself contributed to radicalize people, to participants from the different organizations. So coming together, discussing politics, be ambitious of what we want, that helps to radicalize people. So when we then created this campaign for the welfare state, which in the Robert platform says that we are an alliance between those forces in our society which want to widen and strengthen the struggle against privatization, deregulation and market liberalism for a strong public sector. Six trade unions in the public sector started this campaign. It was the Social Workers Union, Health and Social Care Workers Union, Municipal Workers Union, Teachers Union, Nurses Association, Civil Service Union. That was not the best starting point for us because the, the, the leader of the right-wing populist party at that time, the day after we established this coalition, went out in the media and said, I'm going to fight this alliance wherever I meet them because this is just an attempt by public sector workers to defend their privileges. So it was extremely important for us when we had, after a year, 50-50 between private sector and public sector unions. 17 national trade unions joined into this campaign, of which eight were from the private sector and nine from the public sector. And that argument from the right-wing populist party leader could not be used anymore because it was not only the public sector workers that joined together. We had nine other organizations, even some municipalities. We, we hardly asked them, but they, they initiated it itself, uh, supported this. Two counties, we have 19 counties in Norway. They, two of them supported this campaign. And altogether, one million members were if we, if we count all the members of all these organizations, it was one million. And that is not too bad in a country with five million inhabitants. <laughs> but I must be honest with you. Most of these organizations, they joined this campaign with decision at the top level. And that does not necessarily mean that all the members are mobilized 
not even know about it. So it was a top-down action. Our alternative solution where we said no to privatization and competitive tendering, but we didn't stop there. We said yes to reorganization and renewing and improving the public sector. And we told people how to do that. We, because we had this independent model municipality project as our model of developing the public sector. We had concrete <coughs> examples of a, our unions went into three year long contracts with concrete municipalities saying no privatization, <coughs> no competitive tendering, no sacking of people, but a close cooperation in order to improve and develop the public services. Of course, those were left-leaning municipalities that went into these contracts and they were quite successful. Because in this way we were also able to link these policies and our demands and our alternatives to the daily reality of the users and the workers in the municipalities. It was a bottom-up project and it was quality based on the employees' qualifications because that is what our argument. If you want to improve the quality of public services, it is all about the qualification of the employees. So about the Trondheim model. In, in Trondheim, in, 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 uh, around 2000, the Conservative had dominated the city for a long time. Uh, the trade union and the labour movement was strongly weakened, both organisationally and politically. The Labour Party lost ground. It was Trondheim was, as many other cities, deindustrialized, so it lost a lot of these uh, these core uh, workers' organisations. But then, around 2000, new people came in, new, younger, more radical forces won control of the trade union council in Trondheim, and I must say that. This, these exa the exa example of Trondheim and similar examples which we had in a couple of other cities later in Norway uh, has been possible because people to the left of the Labour Party has got, got control of the trade union movement and could use that as pressure on the Labour Party. Trade unions raised their own political demands pushed Labour to the left and won the 2003 election with an enormous majority. They presented clear alternatives as a basis for mobilising and it has continued up to today because in Trondheim they, these parties on the left, centre-left has won all six elections since 2003. That is also the national election, the results of the national elections. And they seem to win again this autumn because they are running, they are following up what they promised. That is also something new in policy today, isn't it? <laughs> Some of the important thing with, with Trondheim was it was based on unity between workers in private and public sector, between workers and middle class. We had, uh, they had, I was not involved in that, and supported it of course and discussed it with them, but it was the local forces that were able to develop this. And they had extensive discussions in the trade unions. And that, what that did, that it, it rooted the political demands among the members, so that is decisive. If you are not able to root the demands, it, it's very difficult to, 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 to mobilize people. And they challenged this loyalty which is in the Labour movement, in the Labour Party, in the Social Democratic Party. They are all to call, always called for loyalty. Or you cannot go out against us now. That is to weaken us and strengthen the right. 
and they redefine the question of loyalty. Yes, we are loyal, he said, but we are loyal to the policy, not to the organization. That was a very good way of turning it around. They were loyal to the demands and the promises which were given at election, at the election, in the election campaigns, and not to the organizations. And they also learned something that we learned at the national level later, that the pressure against the parties must be maintained also after the election. If not, they slip back into their old-fashioned way of working. And that was part of the problem that we had at the national level. But in Trondheim, they have been able to keep up the pressure. And the concrete demands were followed <coughs> by the politicians when they had major won the election, and to a very high degree also have been implemented by the new majority. At the 2005 election, the Norwegian NO, which is the Labour Congress in, in Norway, uh, tried to follow up some of the experiences from Trondheim. They started a campaign which is called You Decide and on, on your side. So they sent the messages to all the members, individual members, and asked for their proposal. What is the most important thing? What is the most important demands which should be included in this election campaign? And they received 155,000 proposals from 44,000 members. And after all this, a lot of them dealt with the same problems, of course, but based on all these proposals, 54 concrete demands were developed by the Labour Congress and sent to all the political parties. And they got the answer from almost all parties, and there was a very clear difference between the right and the left. And the Norwegian Labour Congress Confederation sent information of that to the members again, and they urged them to vote for one of the red-green parties which have said yes to most of our demands. That was also quite new because the Norwegian Trade Union Confederation never ever before that had supported anything else than the Labour Party. This time they said vote for one of the red-green parties. And it was a strong mobilization for the new political cause and it led to a red-green electoral victory in 2005. So that was sort of the, the success story of the Norwegian experience. And after the government took office in 2005, they actually uh, introduced a number of these uh, promises immediately. This, the labor law was almost destroyed by the previous right-wing government. That was restored. The privatization of school was stopped, was started by the previous government. The same happened to the railway services, which had started, the previous government had started to, to tender uh, passenger transport. That was stopped immediately. Uh, quality municipal projects were started by the government, which is more, more or less a copy of what the Municipal Workers' Union has developed as a method. The nursery schools for all were promised as one of the important things. And it, in some few years that was also met and they also introduced a maximum price. National control of the hydroelectric energy which the previous government had started the process in order to privatize. That was the important victories that we won in this project. But then as you see the title this couldn't last forever. It was too good to be true, wasn't it? So after a very promising start, the government started to slip back to the good old positions. They had problems in fulfilling the government declaration more and more. And it was an election in 2009 which they won, but they won it more on a negative rather than a positive political message. The left, the red-green government campaigned on a negative platform uh, in which they focused more about the threat from the right than their own policies. They won, but the, the, 
entire political situation has changed. And the inequalities in the Norwegian society increased and poverty continued, even though the government, the government has promised to eradicate poverty. So they turned more and more into a soft neoliberal policy, a soft neoliberal pension reform was carried through, and in the national election in 2013, we got the current blue-blue government, because people had got fed up with the sliding back to soft neoliberalism or the red green government. This is one of the reasons, that to explain one of the reasons why we see the, the, the red and blue. Uh, the red here is the um, growth in public sector spending and the blue is private sector. In the 1990s it was the same growth, both in private and in public, in the Norwegian economy. But after that, with the conservative government, the private sector took more and more of the economic growth in society, and the public sector was lagging behind. Only in the two years of financial crisis did the private sector get less than the, than the, the public sector. But after that was more or less over in Norway, it came back again to the old pattern. Uh, most of the economic growth went to the private sector. And that was under a red-green government. So what were the strengths and what were the weaknesses of the campaign we had, or the project we had in Norway? Well, one of the to be honest, I will be very honest with you, the, 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 our campaign was very initiated, very much on the, at the top level, national level. It was not a real grassroots movement that created this development, and that is a weakness. We know we do have to have a very, very strong mobilization from below, and we did not have sufficient support. Broad support from at the top legitimated, of course, the campaign, but the social power was not there. It could be from time to time, we had, and we were criticized for that, being a top-down bureaucratic creature. It was not quite true, but some too is, is it in it. And, but maybe the biggest problem we had was that a big part of the trade union movements got enormous problems in criticizing the labor movement, labor government. So the political independence that we thought we have achieved during this campaign was not as strong as we thought. Because it is very easy to criticize the government and the policies when the right wing is in government in Norway, as we have seen in many other countries, but the same unions accept a lot more when the Labour is in government. And that situation we still have also in Norway. So the strong links to the political parties is a problem in the situation in which the parties do not fill their task. And we therefore also more must admit that we were not able to keep up the pressure on the political parties after the election. So, even though we have been able to push the Labour Party to the left before the election, the forces behind this pro project were not able to keep up the pressure. Also because the Labour Party itself told people again and again in the back rooms, if you criticise us now, you will get the right-wing government next election. That's what they use. And we said to them, because they, this, we who did not, accept this criticism, say, we are just about to get the right-wing government, they said, without election. Well, that's it. We can learn from it. I think there are important things to learn from, from this. What should we have done differently? But what did we do, which was very correct? I think we can pick a lot from that. But now the situation is new, we have this blue-blue government, but 
once again, we have trying to mobilize and build coalition in Norway. There are alternatives, you say. The crisis gives an opportunity to disarm financial capital and regulate the markets. The public sector should not be cut. Quite the opposite, it should be used to damp the effects of the crisis and stabilize the economy. Because we have had an enormous redistribution of wealth also in Norway, not as strongly as in Sweden and in the rest of the world, but also in Norway it's happening, we need a radical redistribution of wealth from the top to the bottom. But it is only trade unions and social forces which have the potential to push solution in this direction. But we have learned in Norway that potential is one thing, practice is something else. So we need a formidable mobilization if we are going to achieve this. And the important thing for me is that in order to achieve that we need not only a program, and I've written your program of priorities for change here, and I'm impressed by what you have developed there, exactly what we need of alternative policies. But the next problem we face is agency and strategy. Because we are not only going to have the program, we are going to have it implemented as well. So we need alternatives, we need programs, but not without also considering agency. Who is going to carry out the struggles to realize these policies? Which kind of social forces, alliances do we have to build? It is a danger, and I've seen that in many countries, also in my own countries, that people on the left also come with sort of wishful thinking and what we call armchair theories, alternatives and models. And they are not so difficult to produce. But they are not always realistic. They are not always possible. Because we have to prioritize, we have to root the demands among the groups which are going to be mobilized, and we have to develop the strategies to achieve them. And this is all too little discussed on the left today, is my experience. We also have to have in mind that we have competitors on the political market. And in many countries, particularly in Europe, there is a very, very strong uh, development on the right. Right-wing populists, extremists, and so on and so on. And one of the most important reasons for that is that people are fed up of the policies of the so-called left when they don't pursue a left policy. And the capitalist crisis creates a real basis for alienation, exclusion, discontent and polarization among people. When workers feel betrayed by the so-called, by their own politicians, they easily are mobilized by the right in the current situation. So the only way of stopping or avoiding or reducing this political development is a policy of the left which politicizes the discontent among people and channels it into a real fight for collective solutions. The new situation, the new initiative we are taking in Norway now is to an attempt to unify all tendencies against the current economic, social and political development. We, in order to do that, the first thing we did was to try to identify the most important so-called conflict lines in society. Where are the potential conflicts, the class contradictions strongest? Because it is along those lines that we have to develop our policies, because it is along those lines that we can mobilize the members. And we identify three most important conflict lines in the development in Norway for the time being. Is one is the restructuring of the labor market. The new government has started to attack the labor laws and the labor market. The rights of the trade unions and workers on the labor market, of course. The second one is the organization of the public sector, which we have the new public management and all this marketization, privatization, and all this development, uh, which we will hear more about today also. And the third conflict line is the centralization of power and resources which is going on also in Norway. And then we have the fourth and different challenge, the, which we heard a lot about yesterday evening, those of us who were here and listened to the exact, uh, excellent speech that 
uh, in Louis Held uh, yesterday, the climate change, the problem of climate change, which we have to face. There is a huge and important difference between climate change and all the other areas of struggle. In all the other areas of struggle, we can lose and we can win and we can delay the struggle and we can make a compromise, but in climate change, we cannot make a compromise. There is no way of compromising with physical laws, with nature. We either win that struggle or we lose completely. So there is a necessity to unify the fight against climate change with the social struggle. And that is another thing that we are trying to do in Norway. Now we are building we are building the coalition now between the trade union movement, the environmental movement, the church and other organizations in order to develop this unification of the struggle. And we see in many countries it is a difficult situation we are in. Uh, and I was impressed by the optimism and energy that we got from Eric Lewis, Eric Lewis yesterday, and we need that, and I think that there are signals that things are happening now. We, there is an increased social unrest in many countries in Europe today. The on, ongoing social degradation is provoking social unrest in country after country. Enormous mobilization, general strikes have taken place in the most crisis ridden country. Even in the peaceful Norway, we had the general strikes at the end of January this year against the Blue Blue government. The 14th of November 2012 is an important date in Europe, an historic day, with coordinated general strikes and actions across many countries in Europe. It is currently a defensive struggle. And we need alternatives, we need leadership, and we need, not least, vision of another society. And a minimum program or some ideas of what we should do, we have to, we have to radicalize our demands. We have, don't have the time to, to, to delay this. We, we have to fight austerity, the end of the public services, of course. We have to redistribute wealth, let the rich pay. We have to cancel public debt created by the financial crisis. We have to socialist banks and financial institutions because they are destroying the economy. We need the investment from these uh, institutions. We have to defend democracy and build power from below. We have to unify the climate with the social struggle. We have to organize, mobilize and meet the complications from capitalist forces. And we have to make the movements move. <laughs> And then the reason for coming here, this is my book. <laughs> Mr. Vall, uh, we got a gift for you. On behalf of the Public Interest Alberta and all of us here today, uh, we want to thank you for your speech and uh, giving us that insight what you're doing within Norway. So uh, I appreciate uh, your time today. We're going to continue on our discussion today as well, and we'll make sure that um, you'll be able to sell many books today, uh, hundreds. And uh, it's our time in Alberta with an election, May 5th, is to uh, make a difference. And actually, uh, it's the grassroots movement that we need to encourage within this room. So thank you. Thanks, Esther, and thanks, Jason. So now is the important time of coffee break. As I mentioned before, though, please do take an opportunity to connect up with Jeremy, get some photos taken, and we'll get that tweeted out. And enjoy the time. We're going to be back uh, right at um, uh, 10.45. We've got uh, Sarah here. I'm very pleased you were able to make it. Her flight was cancelled yesterday morning out of Chicago. So.